latter had a singularly distressing life. Her fiancé had left her in 1791 to rejoin the prince's army and had not seen her again until 1799 when, at the risk of his life, he went from England to Brittany to find her again and to have their union blessed by an unordained priest. He did not marry according to the civil code until 1808. Las Casas packed in his trunks a naval captain's uniform in which he dressed to appear on the Bellerophon and thereupon asked the emperor to decorate him with the Legion of Honor. That must be noticed because the motives which induced Las Casas to throw in his lot with the emperor remain obscure. He did not do so out of moral compunction like Bertrand. He did not, like Montalon or Gorgo, seek the opportunity of writing his fortune or of evading probable banishment. He was not so young at 50 years as to be recklessly carried away by his enthusiasm, and he very well knew how to discipline himself. He had scarcely approached the emperor during his reign. Of all those who followed him, he wrote, I was the one who knew him least. Why was this so? Did not Las Casas' character take its rise from his former career? Doubtless he was convinced that the emperor was a great man, and perhaps the greatest among men. Surely he was willing to dedicate his life to the service of this unfortunate but great man. He did not intend to derive from this sacrifice any particular or material benefit. He quite voluntarily gave his services, and in spite of the fact that he had served in the Hundred Days, the Bourbons had not been severe on him. And so the vanity of a literary man, which was so patent with regard to the Atlas of Lesage, was going to be repeated in some account of the Emperor's life in a narrative of the chief acts of his life and a vindication of the crimes with which he was charged. In short, if Monsieur de Las Casas was appointing himself the spokesman of Napoleon, the authorized interpreter of his word, then there would no longer be 20,000 copies of the Atlas for England, but millions and millions of volumes, which in every language to the end of time would bear the furthermost ends of the earth, the name of Las Casas, united to that of Napoleon. He was besides informed of many things of which his companions were ignorant. Further, he offered himself to the emperor as a new conversationalist eager to listen to him, happy to attend upon him, proud to record his sayings, and to play a role with so distinguished a companion, besides that he had been a sailor, which on a long voyage made him interesting. He had viewed events from an aspect different from that by which the emperor could discern them. He alone belonged to that society from which Napoleon was pleased to recruit his temporary confidence, who approbation he sought and whose education matters he valued. He had the advantage of understanding the English language without the English being aware of the fact they distrusted Madame Bertrand, whose father was an Englishman and who was thus related to the English. But how could they imagine that a Frenchman belonging to Bonaparte's retinue was able to speak English? Las Casas accepted as a secretary in addition to the three officers allowed by the English government was looked upon as an inferior by Montsalain and Gorgo and from the first moment was bullied by the latter who believed him to be a submissive victim, but he was going to raise himself to the first rank and become in a very short time the only man whose conversation which was of the best in consequence of his habit of listening attentively was agreeable to the emperor it was he who without boasting or bustle rendered material service for Madame Bertrand although she had near relations in England well situated to be of use to her was not able did not know how or was not willing to establish communication with them which would have been of advantage to the emperor, while his causes through a certain Lady Clavering, whom he had known in France, had immediately upon the Bellerophon entering the roadstead begun a correspondence, the first result of which seems to have been the appearance of the dreadful bear of the writ. This Lady Clavering was French, the Dylan said she was a milliner at Orléans, with not 
Very illustrious reputation, Miller, maybe. Although she appeared in the Barontage as Clara, daughter of Jeanne de Calais de la Bernadine, Comte de la Sable, and Anjou, names and titles which conjure up visions, but certainly a brave lass, because if the friendship she bore Les Causes inspired his endeavors, they were no less skillful, disinterested, and compromising. In the course of time, Les Causes achieved lesser successes through her, but it can be assumed that she. She was always ready to put herself in his service. The Bertrands, the Monsons, Gorgolas, causes such were the social factors which were going to be associated and compulsively at loggerheads. They were the most incongruous lot one could conceive and nothing it can truly be asserted could render cohabitation tolerable to them. Ceremonial etiquette slacken and being no longer embarrassed by ambition, by regal prestige or military discipline, their true instincts came to light antagonism convinced and those who were worsted were either the best or at least the most sincere the emperor though he did all he could to preserve equanimity among his followers found it was satisfied some did not satisfy others in order to appease them he would have been obliged to camouflage the words he addressed to them with scientific precision he had his reasons for demanding of his companions the formalities of the days of his evidence he owed it to himself solemnly to protest against the abuse of force of which he was the victim he owed it to his son to the dynasty he had found that whose rights had saved him from being outlawed. Finally, he owed it to the people. To the people who had entrusted their fate to him and who defeated with him were prisoners like himself. But if he had not had such weighty and such exalted reasons, he had at least one means of keeping his companions in apparent agreement, and that was to impose upon those around him a manner of living, a behavior, and observances, which as often as possible for stung any social classes. Dr. Mango, what caused serious complications was the absence of a French doctor, the doctor whom Corvassar had brought to Malmaison to deputize for Dr. Ferraud de Beauregard, whom the emperor had commanded to remain in Paris to carry out his duty had on board the Belrophon, while in the Spithead Roads, declared that he did not wish to proceed further. He had agreed to go to the United States, where he had business, but not to say the later. This Mango also asserted that if he had pledged his word to go, he had signed nothing. A start had been made, and there was no opportunity of obtaining a doctor from France, nor even of arranging for one to join the emperor later. They then relied on Ferro and had to take immediate advantage of what was on hand, the Belrophin surgeon, Barry Edward O'Meara, from whom certain of the ship's passengers had received attention, was then approached. He stipulated that he should remain an English officer in the pay of the Admiralty and should in no wise be dependent upon Napoleon. In this manner, were born in innumerable difficulties, avoidable annoyances, and useless troubles. Piotrkowski, the priest, the doctor, in so small a cast, supernumeraries became leading players. Certain of them did not appear until later and scarcely played any part at all, but are mentioned here so that their arrival need not be explained if ever their names appear in the narrative. Others played important roles and deserve particular mention. It is difficult to deal with the mysterious Polish officer, Pinkowski, who, after accompanying the emperor from Malmaison, the Rochefort, followed him to England and then when all his companions, those not allowed to proceed to St. Helena, were deported to Malta, succeeded. It is not known under whose patronage or by what influence in joining Napoleon, found himself suspected at the same time by the English and the French, and after a stay of some months, during which time he remained a riddle, was taken back to England. Then, as a reward for his six months' hypothetical devotion, received annuities and assistance by means of which he lived in luxury during nearly 50 years of journeying round Europe. At St. Helena, no one asked for him, no one inquired about him, no one grieved for him, and he was verily 
a mystery man for whom, for no conceivable reason, obstacles were removed and orders countermanded. He appeared before the emperor in a uniform to which he had no right, took firm root, and was tolerated. He was a glib liar, quite useless, and he departed with no better reason than he had for coming. He was probably only a sharper. This individual who pulled the legs of the English government, Emperor Napoleon, Sardinia, Austria, Russia, and the rest of Europe. On the contrary, the priest whom Cardinal Fesch had sent to St. Helena upon Emperor's request, and the doctor who was to take O'Meara's place to speak, Played a feverish eagerness. Fesh had selected three Corsicans, certainly the most incongruous and the least fit for such a mission. The chief, if he may so be called, was a certain Abbe Antonio Bonavita, 65 years old and a native of Pietralba, formerly a rector in Spain and Paraguay, at the moment apostolic pro notary who madame had discovered in rome at the time of her stay there in 1814 and whom she had engaged as chaplain on the island of elba and in paris he was a very holy man who after leaving madame was engaged by princess pauline but in addition to the fact that his intelligence had always been limited and that he spoke only italian and spanish he had recently experienced two apoplectic fits which had left him in a perpetual trouble and sometimes unable to speak it must be understood that at first Pesh had thought of an Abbe Parigi, whose immorality had been denounced by the Archbishop of Florence, and whom the Holy Father ordered should be relieved of the offices with which he had been invested by Cardinal Fesch. Le Duc de Blaca had not supported this objection, but took no further step to prevent Buonavita, whom he regarded as an octogenarian, being invested with the necessary powers. Taking into consideration his advanced age and his infirmity, Fesch had had given him the assistance of a younger priest, Ange Paul Pignali, who was born in 1789 at Verity, a district of Morsaglia, and who had, it appears, passed through the seminary of St. Sulpice. And after finishing his theological studies in Rome, had studied medicine. He had spent some time at Elba while the emperor was there and had then returned to practice in Rome. It was asserted that the Abbe Vignali was in everything but medicine so ignorant that it made difficult to estimate the skill attributed to him and the emperor informed him that at Longwood he would have to restrict himself to his ecclesiastical duties. He allotted him a stipend of 8,000 francs at the time when he was giving the Abbe Bonavita double that sum. These two priests were gloomy and of no use to the emperor, but at least they didn't annoy him. This was not so of the surgeon, Francesco Antoarchi. He was born in 1779 at Morsaglia, a village on the Capo Corso, and claimed that his father was an attorney. An attorney in a Corsican village of 673 inhabitants. He left educated, perhaps at Vastia, about eight leagues distant only. He has never told us. From Corsica, he went to Leghorn, then to Visa in Florence. He was so, he said, admitted his doctor of philosophy and medicine at the University of Pisa in 1808 when he was 29 years old. This was prior to the annexation of the kingdom of Etruria to the empire and the time when a doctor's degree could be bought from Pisa. Still, so he said, he went to Florence where he gave himself up to physiological studies and became attached to the hospital of Saint Marie Neuve. In 1812, he obtained from the Imperial University the diploma in surgery, and the principal appointed him prosecutor in anatomy attached to the Academy of Pisa and resident in Florence. What appears definite is that he became assistant to Professor Muscani in his anatomical work, and that after the death of this learned man, a society of friends of the arts and mankind, which numbered several Englishmen among its members, having undertaken to publish for the benefit of the Muscani family, his posthumous works commissioned him to superintend the edition and to correct the proofs. And to Marcy, it was certain Simon Colonna de Leca, 
who had been attendant at Aquila under Murat, and who since 1814 had been in attendance on Madame Mer, for whom he acted as Chamberlain or Knight of Honor. This Colonna was a Corsican, completely in Fesch's confidence, and when for various reasons the Cardinal made up his mind to turn down for Rhoda Beauregard, who offered his services, and whom all the Emperor's loyal adherents recommended, he had Colonna write to Entomarchi, who understood immediately the share he would derive from this stroke of luck. Scruples were unknown to him, as was the path of duty. His general intelligence was on a level with his medical knowledge, but he questioned nothing and considered himself everyone's equal. Montsalon, the Grand Marshals, even the Emperors, speaking to each of them in an offensive tone of familiarity and even claiming a superiority. This odious man was of no use to the Emperor and only caused him infinite displeasure. The priests and the surgeons seemed to have been invited to the Emperor's table upon only one occasion, January 1st, 1820. They sometimes lunched with him in the garden when, during the early months of that year, he delighted in working there and put a spade and a pickaxe into the hands of all around him.